And so this evening's discussion, as I had already mentioned, is going to be the beats in Buddhism, a reappraisal. And I see a reappraisal, and I, I, I did a little bit of research, and I gave the first talk on the beats and Buddhism back around 2002. And then I've given several times since then, slightly different one. This particular presentation was given about two years ago. And many people who are part of the Mahasanga at now did not see it at that time. And I thought that those who did see it might enjoy it for a second time. And now I did tweak it a little bit, so it's not exactly the same presentation, but it's, it's fairly similar. And when I was thinking about this topic several years ago, a book suggested by Gary Bauer titled Wisdom Anthology of North American Buddhism arrived and a book that I do recommend those who are interested in uh, literature in general. And again, the title of it is Wisdom Anthology of North American Buddhism. It's a really well-written uh, work. And the, but at the time that I got the book from Gary, I thought to myself, well, I got the recommendation and received the book when, I, when I'd ordered it. I thought to myself, and there you have it, it's a sign. Not just any sign, but a sign specifically from Lawrence Ferlinghetti himself. And so, how could I resist? We're going to talk about the beats in Buddhism, and I have to start with none other than Lord Buckley. If you get to it and you cannot do it, then there you jolly well are, aren't you? <laughs> And so we'll start with what were the beats? And as we were talking earlier, it was a literary movement that started. We, we think of it in the 1950s, though some of the people who were um, prominent in the beat um, literature actually started writing in the late 40s. But we typically attribute it to the 50s through the 90s, although, as you'll see later, there are still some of the people who were from that time who continued to write in a beat fashion. Um, see if I, yeah. And so one of the points that I want to make is that the beat writers were often portrayed in the media as degenerates, but they saw themselves as spiritual seekers forging a new kind of consciousness. And I think that that's an important uh, thought to keep in mind. Um, and as Allen Ginsberg said, we were beatifically beat. Now, a common theme that linked them all together was the rejection of the prevailing American middle class values, the purposelessness of modern society, and the need for withdrawal and protest. This was set against the backdrop of the Eisenhower era of middle class values in which it was considered to be virtuous to be more homogeneous. The Cold War a rapid expansion of consumerism and the development of a suburban society, which was seen by many to suppress a more interactive human society. And I wonder if they were seeing an analog of that period in today's society. I wonder if we're seeing an analog of that period in today's society. They consider themselves as countercultural, and one wonders what they might think about Buddhism being more mainstream today would they still be as interested? They wrote that society was insane and they were normal, but because society viewed itself as normal, that they were going to be insane. Now that I think about it, society today is not normal by the standards that the Beats had established. Who were the Beats? And we have three separate groups. You had on the East Coast, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Diane De Palma, Harold Norris, Neil Cassidy, Gregory Corso, and others. San Francisco, you had, and the West Coast in general, Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, Albert Sejo, Bob Kaufman, Joanne Kiger, and of course others. Both sides of the Atlantic was Ann Charters, William Burroughs, the second, 
Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and Michael McClure. Oops, I went ahead a little bit too quick. Let's see if we can go back here. There we go. Following in the footsteps of Emerson, Thoreau, Whitman, and others, the Beats began to adapt the Buddhist teachings of the East to a new, particularly American terrain, incorporating American myths and ideals, as well as the landscape. By writing about their discoveries in the jazzy vernacular rhythms of the street, the Beats radically increased the proportion of the populace exposed to Buddhism. And it's important to note that these writers, poets and artists, were celebrities in their day. They were vilified by some and deified by others, rarely ignored, and are firmly a part of the American experience. From an article by Jane Falk titled Finger Pointing at the Moon, Zen and the Poetry of Philip Whalen, I'll, read, I'll quote, Allen Ginsberg, for example, described Whalen in 1955 as the seminal Sixth Gallery poet reading in San Francisco as a strange, fat young man from Oregon in appearance, a Zen Buddhist bodhisattva who read poetry written in rare post Poundian assemblages of blocks of hard images set in juxtaposition like haikus. Whalen, and that's, um, that's the uh, complete quote, Whalen was also included in the summer 1958 Zen issue of the Chicago Review with Gary Snyder, D.T. Suzuki, Alan Watts, Jack Kerouac, among others. In other words, this, the writings were countercultural but they were appearing in mainstream literary context. And I think that that's, that's important to, to keep in mind. Now we can go to the next one. Buddhism and the beats. The Dharma also fed the, Buddha, the beat appetite for exotic experiences, promising them the immediacy of now, the feeling of being with it, present for every note in the great jazz riff of life. Wes Nisker writes in Beat Buddha. Many of the Beats found a refuge for their restless spirit in the philosophy and practices of Buddhism. The Dharma offered these curious Westerners a new way to understand the human condition, along with methods to free the mind from habitual and obsessive thinking. Also appearing to the Beats was the Buddhist emphasis on developing inner wisdom and universal compassion, anecdotes to the values of the competitive, consumer society that the Beats had rejected. In a 1995 article on Buddhism and the Beats, Richard Wakefield wrote, the Beat generation writers were out to destroy barriers to spiritual growth and their disdain for rules. Far from being an end in itself was part of the search for enlightenment beyond convention. Despite accusations of nihilism and hedonism, there were passionate believers. The poet, Michael McClure, claimed that the movement was a spiritual occasion. Allen Ginsberg said of his poems that the poems are religious and I meant to be. And in the famous obscenity trial over his book, The Howl, the judge conceded that the poem ends with a plea for holy living. And for people who are not aware of that, Howell uh, uses language which I probably shouldn't use. Um, in this in this um, Zoom meeting, and he was sued for obscenity, but also he was sued. The, he, they tried to cut down the book because it portrayed explicit homosexual as well as heterosexual acts. And we have to keep in mind that the sodomy laws were in place in America in the 1950s. How it came out, I think, originally in 1956. So Jack Kerouac, too, described his goal as to become immersed in the truth that is the one undifferentiated purity. And the Beats were drawn to Eastern spirituality, especially Buddhism, as an antidote to the rigid, rationalizing dogma of mainstream American religion. America had become a society of barriers. So how did... Buddhism influenced the Beats. And we see there Philip Whalen, who became a Zen monk, 
uh, when everything exists within your big mind, all dualistic relationships drop away. There is no distinction between heaven and earth, man and woman, teacher and disciple. In your big mind, everything has the same value. And of course, that's Suzuki notion. In the teachings of Buddhism, members of the Beat Generation began to find some sanity. The big view or big mind of Buddhism, which suggested a horizonless space, a state of cosmic, all-encompassing awareness, proved a powerful antidote to the restrictive views espoused by the government, the literary establishment, and organized religion. This was taken from Big Sky Mind, the article, the uh, quote that you have there from Suzuki Roshi uh, in the Beat Generation by Carol Tomlinson, who is the editor. Similarly, Tibetan teacher Chogyam Rinpoche described panoramic awareness as a state without center or fringe in which there is no watcher or perceiver, no division between the subject and the object. Instead, the distinction between self and other is abolished in the experience of the empty sky itself. The elimination of that distinction and the recognition that such dualistic perceptions and illusions offered an irrefutable rebuke to the sense of hierarchy fundamental to the society and political structures of the 50s. And Buddhism's advocation, advocation of a mendicant, homeless life also suggested the practical alternative to the rapidly accelerating cycle of work, produce, consume that was the engine driving 50s culture. There's a quick side note um, that I have, and that is that uh, Suzuki Roshi was not considered a beat, and he wrote no poetry or novels that are part of that genre. But he did make a significant contribution to the movement, as did Trungpa Rinpoche, especially to Allen Ginsberg. And they both seem to appear on the scene at exactly the right time with their distinctive perspectives. And so I, I think that it might be important to look at some of their, their writings. And the, they were a prolific lot. They wrote poetry, novels, essays. They were graphic artists, musicians, and performers. Though the majority of their art was written media. But then you had other people like Philip Glass, who really wasn't considered a beat, but was highly informed by the beat movement. And you had other people that, uh, even people like um, Salvador Dali, while not a beat, uh, in some of his writings, he talks about the influence of their writings on, on some of his work. Um, as a result, it's truly difficult to try to find writings that will fit easily in this media, meaning PowerPoint uh, and Zoom. Following is a brief sampling of just a few pieces of poetry that are not necessarily representative. Also, the representation on the page is difficult since the poetry tends to be free form and highly graphic. A few short pieces I have selected fit the space and can be digested in a short period of time. We should keep in mind that I selected pieces that specifically address Buddhist subject matter in some way or another. However, the majority of their work was secular in nature, one might argue influenced by Buddhism. It is also important to mention that Buddhist writings from the earliest periods, the Nikaya and Mahayana, think of the Dharmapada, sayings formed into verses to be memorized, Nagarjuna's Mula Majjhimika Kakarika in some 40, 450 verts, verses develops the doctrine that nothing, not even the Buddha or Nirvana, is real in and of itself. These are in couplets. So presentations of Buddhist material has always been um, related to poetic forms. And so we'll, we'll look at a sampling. And, I, and again, this is just a sampling. And the first one is by a person who didn't actually write as much uh, poetry as he did plays and some other forms. And you'll see the way that I've represented this, which is the way it's represented uh, in the book of poetry. Gasho to all sutras, gasho to daydream cartoons of monkey mind. G-A-S-S-H-O, to the old scholar surrounded by cool snakes, 
see the landscape of industrial buildings, artifice of concrete. Is there, not there, 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 and not there. If that doesn't sound Buddhist, I don't know what does. And I'm not going to make a lot of a lot of comments about these. You can you can decide yourself. Here's one by <clears throat> Diana De Prima or Suzuki Roshi, and she was a student of uh, Suzuki Roshi. After you died, I dreamed you were at my apartment. We ate soba together. You giggled and slurped a lot. You said, don't tell them I'm not dead, and pointed down the street toward the Zen Center. I don't want them to bother me. We laughed and drank the broth. I kept that promise. I think they still don't know. And this one is by Gary Snyder. Straight, it's walking through Myoshinji. Straight stone walks, up lanes between mud walls. The sailors who handle the ships from Korea and China. The carpenters' chisels like razors. Young monks working on Mu. And the pine trees that surrounded the city. The ancient ones, each one anonymous. Green needles, lumber. Ash, written in Kyoto. And many of you may know Gary Snyder's uh, many, many writings, specifically on ecology. And of course, to me, a great folk hero when I was younger. And I want to include a sample that was not directly addressing Buddhism or a Buddhist scenario. However, this is a, the one on the picture on the right is a poster that was done for a reading that um, Allen Ginsberg was going to be giving on Howell and other poems. And you'll see that he is standing in a pose of a Buddha. And I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked. That's the beginning of, of Howell, of the poem Howell. Uh, so I wanted to, to include this. Um, and Howell is, is probably his most famous um, collection of poetries. The collection led to a well, much publicized court case that I, I mentioned just a few, mi few minutes ago. Um, what I, I didn't mention is that as Allen Ginsberg had said on numerous occasion, occasions, thank goodness for the court case because it probably sold many more books than otherwise I would have been able to, to sell. <laughs> it's interesting how that happens, isn't it? Um, Did he win the case? Or he won it? the case. He won the case. And he won the case, and interestingly enough, the judge specifically stated that he won the case because while it did represent sodomy and sexuality and all that sort of thing, that um, free speech permits people to say what they need to say, and it wasn't purient. So that was, that was the judge's decision. Um, he includes such poem as a Sunflower Sutra, which is evocative of karma and rebirth. And I already mentioned the picture on the left and the quote. Um, the picture on the right, or the picture on the left, I'm sorry, the picture on the left explores the nature of dukkha, loving kindness, compassion, even the bodhisattva concept, which was this consciousness, subconsciousness, or reading it comes from having read so much of the author over time that I know about. In other words, when you read the full poem, poem named Songs, that's evocative to me. Was that subconscious on his part, or am I reading into it? Or maybe both things can be true. 
and we have Joan Tiger. This actually is one of my favorites of all of these. The Dew Sweet Law is not flowing literature, but is still open morning after morning and totally excellent. As the bachelor quail looks up in the quiet air, all the food is his. And she wrote that after reading Nagarjuna, as she reports it. And that was, as you can see, in 1998. So that was rather, that was rather late. Um, and that's the last of the samples. I hope they give you a feel for the degree to which there was a series and intersection of Buddhism and beat writing. And you can see that they were fairly well um, read in intention by intentionally, I mean, the Buddhist works were fairly well read by serious practitioners. When you read that um, Joanne was reading Nagarjuna and, uh, and other people, these weren't just sort of pop. Buddhism that was being that was being consumed at that time. So one of the other questions that we have then is, how did the Beats influence Buddhism? Well, the Beats wrote novels and spoke about their newfound spiritual inspiration. They founded Buddhist communities. Naropa and Spirit Rock are two of those that are well known uh, today. And many of the Beats' early experiences with Buddhism were through connections to the already well-established Japanese-American Buddhist community in the San Francisco Bay Area. But Thoreau argues that scholars should take seriously the contribution beat writers made, and this is a quote, to American religious history. And it is something of, of a foregone conclusion that this contribution includes perspectives inspired by Asian religious traditions. In rejecting what they viewed as the rep repressive climate of the 1950s, the Beats collectively turned east for inspiration. And some, notably Jack Kerouac, Gary Snyder, Deanne De Palma, Allen Ginsberg, Joe Kiger, and Philip Whelan, explicitly sought inspiration from Buddhism. Little scholarly work, and that's, um, that's the end of that quote, Little scholarly work has been done on the beat Buddhism connection, either in Buddhist studies or the study of American religion. There may be a lingering bias against the beats. This may be due to a sense that their movement was nothing more than a short-lived and decadent rebellion against the Eisenhower era culture. Buddhist studies scholars often cringe at the way beat writers misrepresent Buddhist teachings, and other critics have rightly pointed out the latent racism and sexism in the early beat writing. And that's something that when you do a lot of reading on it, you will come across uh, pretty, pretty quickly, recognizing that this writing was coming out of the 50s into the 60s. By the 70s, you don't see that same racism and sexism present, um, but in the early writings, you do see it. So I'm interested in reappraising the role of the beats. Kerouac and Ginsburg were at the vanguard of the beat movement that sought to replace a rigid and materialistic post-war America with spontaneous beat lifestyle. Doubtless then, the Zen appealed to them as a breath of fresh air in a stultifying 1950s society. But Buddhism offered Kerouac and Ginsburg something more, a completely new relationship to their own selves, and that was by Eric Mortensen. Wes Nisker wrote, my first encounter with the Dharma, a term which refers to the teachings of the Buddha, came in the title of a novel by Jack Kerouac, The Dharma Bums. The story is an account of a summer spent by Kerouac and poet Gary Snyder as forest fire lookouts in the Sierra Mountains, a time during which they muse about Zen and haiku poetry and discuss Buddhist concepts such as emptiness and samadhi ecstasy, which Kerouac describes as the state you reach when you stop your mind. Like many in the Western world, and especially in America, <coughs> I was first introduced to Buddhism by this book and others written by the poets and artists known as the Beat Generation, unquote. And so I'll leave that at that point. These are some of the sources. It's not an exhaustive uh, list, but these are some of the sources. And just a side note, the picture you see there uh, was a photo 
of a group uh, taken at the Virginia Military Institute cadets by Gordon Ball, a friend of Allen Ginsberg, and it just sort of <laughs> tickles me every time I see it to see military cadets reading Howl together. <laughs> Isn't that a great, a great photo? And actually, uh, people may not be aware that Jack Kerouac was born and grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. And so he's a, a homegrown local, as, as it were, in many ways. Charles Johnson, in his afterword to the emergence of American Buddhist literature, writes, art does not happen outside of history. Um, writes that art, and this is a quote, art does not happen outside of history. Art is always forged in the tempestuous crucible of a particular historical moment in a specific hour in cultural history in the enveloping society and in the state of one's profession at a moment of time, which define and determine the real creative and imaginative possibilities for the work of any artist, scientist, educator, or scholar. I think that one can say the same for the development of Buddhist philosophy, practices, and teachings. Nagarjuna's teachings came at a particular moment and place in time that was ripe for the message. And Chigi lived during an axis of historical convergence. Saicho's contributions would likely not have happened 50 years earlier or 50 years later. The Beats as a movement, as a specific influence on and influence by Buddhism, were specific to the conditions in which they had found themselves 70 to 40 years ago. The subculture lasted for about 30 years. The beats, well, from my per per perch, I have to put it that way, from my perch, as someone attracted and sympathetic to the beats, art message, I can now see that they were on one end of a societal spectrum of views and behaviors at odds with society at large. They would be the first to agree with me. They relished in their radical being. They planted seeds of Buddhism that are still blossoming today. Some of the flowers are beautiful, fragrant, and colorful. Others are weeds that we must pull out by the roots so they don't grow deeply and contaminate the rest of the garden. Anything that is an extreme has the potential to overwhelm. The beets, in a way, they did not perhaps intend gave us an interesting taste of dharma though we must be careful to respect their writings their teachings and see the misinterpretations for what they were and move on this is the nature of the middle way to examine the extremes see what is useful and true in their own context and move on to an understanding in the middle the extremes can be attractive, even contain an element of veracity, but often unobtainable and undesirable. We're living in times of great flux and extremes. And if we adopt the extremes without a willingness to examine the alternatives and work to a consensus, even compromise, we're blinded by arrogance. Recognize the provisional and the absolute are occurring simultaneously, and that let this lead you to equanimity. Svaha. And let me pull up the quote. The suffering itself is not so bad. It's the resentment against suffering that is the real pain. Allen Ginsberg. I find an incredible amount of wisdom in that very short quote. <clears throat>